and gentlemen, my name is Cheryl Sheeman, and yes, I did fly in from Beverly Hills, but I'm very proud to say that I'm a farm girl born and raised in Southern Ohio, Portsmouth to be specific. And <laughs> I absolutely love Ohio, um, but I was a cancer patient, and at that time, uh, literally facing an end of life issue, and I was what was considered to be a, a marijuana refugee, and actually had to leave the state. And this impacted my entire family. I was unable to see my mother and father for eight years because quite frankly, the amount of cannabis that I had to use was so high, so to speak, that I, if I had gotten caught, I, I would have gone to prison for quite some time and it really impacted my family. Uh, my mother passed away this past year and it really broke my heart because at that time, Ohio was still an illegal state and cancer took her very quickly, very painfully, and it, it was excruciating to watch. And I made a promise to her um, as she was passing away that I would be active here in Ohio and do everything that I can so that no family ever has to suffer like that again. And um, I'm just curious, a couple things before we start this little video. How many of you are interested in getting into the industry by applause? Okay, and how many of you are patients and just want to learn more about the industry? Okay, so it's fair to say that most of you are interested in getting into the business. Okay, that's good, because I like to know who I'm talking to. Now, how many of you like gifts? <laughs> well, I brought two Beverly Hills Cannabis Club stash jars that are 14 karat gold leaves, and I brought two little Beverly Hills Cannabis Club ashtrays to give away as gifts. You're going to see one of these little red bags floating around. One will have my business card in it, so if you want my business card, it actually has my direct cell phone on it. You're welcome to take one, and then I'm going to draw from the other little red bag, and at the end of my talk, I'm going to give these away to whosoever card that I pull out. Is that fair? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Happy, happy, joy, joy. Okay. Um, now, this might sound like a silly question. Do do any of you have any idea who I am or what I do? <laughs> no, okay. So, <laughs> um, I'll just give you a few hints. I am known internationally. The media refers to me as the Martha Stewart of marijuana. I've been in this industry since 1992 and it has not always been kind to women. The women that were in the business back then were uh, mostly topless girls that used to wear little pasties over their nipples and sell pop for their boyfriends. And here I was, a mom of two, um, known at that time as a serious corporate businesswoman, and then I got cancer. And when I got cancer and cannabis healed me, everything changed in my life. And it was in 1992 that I started getting more active in this industry and started working on the legislative, political, and media strategy front for three of the most wealthy men in the world. Uh, they are not necessarily light, but they had a lot of money to throw towards uh, marijuana legalization, and they were George Soros, Peter Lewis, and John Swirling. They're the three billionaires that have funded practically every single regulatory framework in this country since the beginning. So with that being said, I'm going to run a little video that will take you a little bit through my life story in seven minutes or less. Give you an idea of what my life is like in Beverly Hills and the Beverly Hills Cannabis Club, which is our cannabis club, and then I'll tell you a little bit of what we're doing moving forward. So I'm going to attempt this video. <laughs> and don't forget to put your business card in those little things and we'll, we'll pull from the end. Perspective on today's top trending stories. But is she the queen of cannabis or a snake oil salesman in this booming $47 billion industry? As an end of life care. Let's go inside. To save my life. No politician, even if they thought it was a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I love him, right? <laughs> that is not a cigarette Zach Galpinagas pulled out on Real Time with Bill Maher. Well, I think we officially all know now where he stands on the great marijuana legalization debate. And Louis, you recently sat down with the lady who is all for it. Cheryl Schumann, she's a fascinating woman. It was a cancer diagnosis that led to her second career as a medical marijuana concierge, a $47 billion industry, by the way. Many have criticized her. They've called her a con artist, a snake oil salesman, a drug addict, but she shakes them all off. Tonight, the insider investigates the Beverly Hills Cannabis Queen. I love marijuana. I grow it. 
I smoke it, I vaporize it, I cook with it, I eat it raw. Whatever you call it, the queen of cannabis or the Martha Stewart of marijuana, one word defines Cheryl Schumann. Resilient. You have more life. Right, we have. <laughs> and you keep getting back up. It's crazy. When I got into this, I, I was dying. I was $600,000 in debt. I lost almost all my hair. It was not pretty. But people wait, most of them. Cheryl was born at the square. I hold on. It's back with one. No running water, no electricity. No time. That's her, the CBS documentary from the 1960s. Those early roots seeded in her a relentless drive to succeed. But in 2006, after a successful business career, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and given just months to live. I was rushed into emergency surgery. They did a radical hysterectomy, uh, removed ovary, uterus, part of my colon, part of my bladder. And the cancer had spread. Yeah. But there was a blessing in, in that cancer. Yes. The blessing came in the form of a drug which in 1996 in California had been approved for medical use. Marijuana. Cheryl used oil derived from the plant to alleviate her symptoms and made a remarkable recovery. You reach a point where you'll do almost anything to have one last day with the people that you love and care about. Cheryl began growing the plant and using her Hollywood connections, she started a Beverly Hills collective which caters to high society. Literally. Her clients, A-list actors, agents, lawyers, and doctors. How did you conceive this? I mean, you're just recuperating from cancer and you, you thought of this spur of the moment? You know, to me it was just obvious. It was just obvious because the luxury market, the affluent market hadn't been tapped yet. So I was like, let's start doing mansion parties and going back to the old speakeasy concept where we had great parties, DJs, chefs, they come in, it's great. It's couture cannabis. It is couture cannabis. And the couture cannabis business is booming. Cheryl has grown her collective to include over 1,700 private members, all holders of medical marijuana cards, as required by California state law. Hi there, it's Cheryl. We're out at the greenhouse. Just wanted to share this with you. It's really beautiful, as you can see. But her ambitions are much grander than cannabis-themed parties. She's building an empire, buoyed by over $600 million in venture capital money. She's also the executive director of Moms for Marijuana, and has become an outspoken advocate for legalization. This is the very first chance in our lifetimes that we can change the course of history and show by living example that the American dream is still possible. Call it the popcorn boom, and one woman is planning to be front set. But at the end of the day, you take a look at yourself and say, you know, what does my life really stand for? And when I see now that there's a good chance that I'm going to go down in history as the woman who led the overturn of a cannabis prohibition, that's what I'm proud of. Right now, recreational use of marijuana is legal in four states, Colorado, Washington, Alaska, and Oregon. Nevada could be next. And Cheryl's already got her sights set on Vegas, where she plans to build a cannabis resort and make yoga. Hey, Some kind of a fair 
fair and balanced system so that our young people aren't getting locked up and losing their opportunities to have a life. Doug, in support of another type of Green Party, point out taxpayers spend more than one billion bucks annually taking care of pot prisoners, according to the U.S. Department of Justice. Another factor blocking the blue, and it has nothing to do with politics. The drought is impacting not only family farms, but the cannabis industry. And they're estimating in some places that we're going to lose about 70% of our yields. So whether it's mother nature or human nature, the cannabis conversation is the talk of the ticket. With an election year coming out, the Dota debate will surely stay on fire. As for Cheryl Schumann's next big venture, opening 420 friendly vacation resorts. Stay tuned as KTLA continues to cover the extraordinary cannabis controversy. For Body Smart, I'm Glenn Walker. Does that help give you an idea of <laughs> what I'm doing? So, um, one of the things that I want to talk to you about is not necessarily any particular product, because in my opinion, the most, the most important product you can have is yourself. And I want to talk to you a little bit about personal branding, because no matter what products you're using or promoting or selling, or whether you're going to be a cultivator, an extractor, or a grower or a dispensary owner, the bottom line is people need to know you. And this is an industry that has been in the shadows for so long that I feel it's vitally important to come down from the mountains and out of the shadows and into the light. And the other thing that I've found since I've been in the industry, and I'm kind of an old timer, I just turned 57 years old, and I've been in this industry since 1992. So I remember a lot. I've been shot at three times because the prohibitionists didn't like me so much. They accused me of being a con woman and just trying to get all of our kids uh, to become drug addicts, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I feel that most of the people that I've met, I've, I've actually helped to build over 1,700 companies all throughout the world from almost every state in the United States. I also work in Israel. I work a lot in Canada and Vancouver and Toronto and was recently contracted with Puerto Rico, Colombia, Australia, and New Zealand because all of those countries have now become legal. And it's very, very interesting what we've put together as a best practices system here in the United States. I think uh, Colorado has done an amazing job of generating revenue and the bottom line is I personally would much rather see my taxes go to after school care programs, to veterans programs, and quite frankly a lot of these people that are jailed are jailed because the private prison, prison systems need those quota of uh, jail and convicts. And a lot of these uh, people being arrested for cannabis, to be quite frank, are young people, usually people of color, who've gotten caught with a joint somewhere, and some of them are spending 15 years to life in prison. And putting that into perspective, just think about this. A young black man in Texas arrested for baking a pan of pot brownies for his 90-year-old grandmother who was suffering from cancer, got arrested, ratted out, and was facing 15 years to life because he was black, and because he was in the wrong state. And that is just wrong. These kids, now I'm 57 with two grown daughters, and these children should not have to lose their lives because they experimented with a joint. And another thing you'll find very interesting is rich white people don't go to jail. It's poor people that go to jail because they cannot afford to get out. That's usually what happens. And I really feel that we have to take a serious look at what our tax revenue system is doing to rebuild these communities. Because you know what's happening to, to these kids? When they get out of jail, they're out committing crimes, and a lot of times they become opioid users. In my home county, how many of you are familiar with Scioto County? Okay. Scioto County is where I was born and raised. I was actually born and raised up Twin Creek Holler, about 20 miles down near the Adams County line. No running water, electricity. When I say we used to have to walk two miles down the lane with holes in our shoes to catch the school bus, I'm not kidding. And you know I'm not kidding. Because <laughs> most of us didn't have running water, electricity up there. You know, we were happy to just have a roof over our heads. But I do believe that what you uh, as entrepreneurs have to do is number one, you have to really believe in yourself. And even if you, let me ask you another question, not to get personal, but how many of you are funded? How many of you have the actual money to put together a company? Okay, one person, two, three, you're already in business. 
Okay, so, so three people roughly. So you either have to find money, uh, which is sometimes easy. Uh, we manage about $600 million in investment capital for people all over the world. These are venture capitalists, investment bankers. Some of them are private investors that are old-timers that just want to see cannabis legalized in their lifetime. They've always felt like it should be done, and it's a legacy project. But if you don't have a lot of money, one of the things that I found is a lot of people starting businesses are motivated and inspired because someone in their lives, whether it's a loved one, a school teacher, their brother, their sister, their aunt, their uncle, their grandpa, someone that they know personally has been impacted by cannabis or wanting a better quality of life or they've seen their loved one in pain and just like um, the young woman was speaking earlier, and then to see that pain go away instantly because they were able to use the endocannabinoid system to work. Yep.